Excuse me, nope. Alright guys, well so much for our spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful week. The opening of October 2023. It is now a cloudy, rainy, gloomy day, but at least we have one more day of warmth to run around barefooted and t-shirted uh, here on Friday. October 6, 2023, and uh, so we will see if I uh, have the energy for my weekly ecological meltdown roundup rant from mongabay.com. Might happen tonight, but right now, while I wait for the next deluge of vacation tourists to come enjoy the driving rain this week, uh, guys, uh, I just can't hold it in any longer. I know you guys have been wondering when I was going to weigh in on the Great Sycamore Tree Massacre over there. And, uh, and, uh, where is it? England. That's it. I knew that I would think of that country over there in Zombie Island, on the other side of the pond, I guess some big-ass sycamore tree was cut down by some clueless moron uh, a little over a week ago, and of course this tree has now become the most famous tree on the planet, and, and you know, guys, I, like anybody else reading this story, you know, when I first read this story, uh, you know, I was just filled with every bit of moral outrage as the rest of us. Uh, that some clueless moron, I guess it was two guys, some 16-year-old kid and some guy my age, uh, took a chainsaw in the middle of the night and cut down this, what they're calling a 300-year-old sycamore tree. I believe. So anyway, guys, I was as outraged as anybody else when I first read this story. And you know, I am still uh, have my sense of moral outrage, you know, sitting in this uh, tiny house built out of these giant hemlock trees from around me. Uh, exercising my moral outrage of cutting down trees inside a tiny house uh, from cutting down trees. You know, then, <clears throat> after about five minutes of moral outrage, the old Doomer started kicking in, and the first thing I was thinking, I, I wasn't even at all sure that sycamore trees were native to England. Uh, I, I, and so uh, that took about 20 seconds to look up. I actually thought they were native to the U.S., and maybe there are some native American varieties, but I guess they're from mainland continental Europe and were brought over to England. Uh, apparently, they think in the 1600s, is when the first sycamore tree ever saw uh, England. And then, you know, I have to be honest, guys, the, the, these damn sycamore trees. I, I have been cussing sycamore trees pretty much my whole life. Uh, I don't know how many of these damn things. They're, they're messy. They're, they're what's called a self-pruning tree, self-pruning, which is a euphemism for making a big-ass mess all over your beautiful lawn. You know, uh, there's no better way to ruin a beautiful expanse of, of lawn, of, of turf, than to, than to put a damn sycamore tree out in the middle of your, of your lawn. Uh, they're, they're messy, they, they drop branches all over the place. 
they're claiming this sycamore in England is, you know, centuries old. I, I don't know. Maybe I just haven't been around uh, sycamore trees. So, you know, if it had been up to me, the damn tree never would have gotten uh, 300 years old because I would have sawed it down. And, and then even the firewood is worthless. It's a pretty worthless... I call a sycamore tree a weed tree. Uh, but, but anyway, so, you know, there, there was a little bit of that. Uh, but then, of course, the bigger question is looking at this uh, sycamore tree out in the middle of this barren expanse. This one tree sticking up in what looks kind of like, I, I, I don't know, West Texas. Just this ugly, barren, uh, mowed over uh, sheep farm. And, and this is actually inside a national park. There seems to be one tree, or there used to be one tree inside a national park. And, and, and my question is, where are all the other trees? Uh, where is the outrage uh, of, uh, of, of the entire British Isles being uh, mowed down in, in, into one big sheep farm? Uh, all of this outrage uh, uh, over this one tree, uh, no mention of the other 300 million trees, as far as I know, guys, right here at Bugs in a Jar Farm, and if you look at uh, photographs, you know, from about a hundred years ago, up here in upstate New York and New England, uh, this place looked a hell of a lot like uh, that national park over in England. Uh, that this is all second growth forest all through here. Uh, these hills where I am, these beautiful forested hills <clears throat> looked pretty much like the barren wasteland uh, known as Zombie Island. Uh, and the forest here has grown back because one of the reasons is that they stopped grazing sheep. But, but anyway, I'm getting uh, ahead of myself. So, uh, let's, oh uh, yeah, so, I, and, and the other thing is, while I was waiting for the outrage about the other 300 million trees that were cut down by clueless morons, uh, how many centuries ago, uh, all over the damn planet, I knew that Andy the Gardener, uh, had to have a spin on this story. So, uh, Andy the gardener <coughs> came through today <coughs> and sent uh, me his version of the event. So, at the end of this story, uh, we're going to hear from Andy the gardener, whose opinion of what happened over there in, uh, in, uh, the Sycamore Gap, or the former Sycamore Gap, I'm quite sure, is the most accurate representation of what happened, but we're going to, uh, we're going to hold off hearing from uh, Andy the Gardener. So let's hear what the Guardian has to say about this. The title of their Down to Earth uh, <clears throat> Roundup, Life After the Sycamore Gap Vandalism. So I guess life has now been separated into two epochs. You have life before that tree was cut down and life after, after the sycamore vandalism. So we have entered a new epoch in humanity known as life after the sycamore gap vandalism. What next? What next? 
after the illegal felling of Britain's 300-year-old tree. This is written by some fellow never heard of him named Ben Martinoga. Take it away, Ben. Last week, Britain lost a living legend, the venerable and much venerated sycamore tree illegally felled in Sycamore Gap on Hadrian's Wall was a genuine film star. Hmm, having featured in the Hollywood blockbuster Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, my guess is Robin Hood never laid his eyes on a sycamore tree. When did Robin Hood, I, I don't even remember when Robin Hood and King Arthur and all of those guys uh, my guess is there were no sycamore trees in Sherwood Forest, but since I have no clue when uh, Robin Hood uh, took place, uh, I don't know. You know, it's kind of like tumbleweeds that you see in all of these westerns, you know, from the mid-1850s. Tumbleweeds are an exotic species. They're Russian thistles that uh, were introduced in 1890. There was never a tumbleweed in the Old West, uh, just as there was never a sycamore tree in Robin Hood, I don't think. <clears throat> it was a tree that was laden with memories, an iconic being that countless visitors from near and far felt a strong connection to a howl of anguish, a howl of anguish rippled out from this tree's sparsely populated corner of England and spread across the globe. What kind of torment, what kind of torment could drive someone to do such a thing? Well, a torment and a chainsaw. To add insult to injury, the very next day saw the publication of Britain's latest State of Nature report and fresh news of nature under sustained assault and wildlife in rapid decline. And all this Hot on the heels of the UK government announcing their plans to approve new oil and gas projects in the North Sea, while also reining in crucial actions needed to reach net zero. Yes. <coughs> on cue, <coughs> we learned that global average temperatures for September smashed previous records by a genuinely terrifying margin. It has not been a good week. But back to the, vandaliz the vandalization of that famous and dearly loved tree. What does it really say about our relationship with the non-human world? And might this sorry interlude carry any seeds of <laughs> carry any seeds of <laughs> carry any seeds of <laughs> and uh, before we head over to Hadrian's wall this uh this story reminded me, I'm probably going to go off on several tangents during uh, the sad tale of the, uh, the non-native sycamore tree, uh, the only tree within 500 miles. Uh, did you know, I wish I remembered the year on this, I should have actually looked up the actual dates and stuff behind this that uh, we all think of redwood trees as being the tallest tree on the planet. I think now the tallest tree 
on the planet is, what is it, 365 feet tall, which is, what, 100 meters tall. Well, I think it was around 100 years ago that the tallest tree on planet Earth was, in fact, not a redwood tree. This is just one more misconception. The tallest tree uh, on the planet was actually a Douglas fir tree. And there was this giant Douglas fir tree. It wasn't far from Seattle. And uh, that tree measured over 400 feet tall. I mean, an another 40, 50 feet taller than the uh, tallest redwood. And it was widely known <clears throat> that this Douglas fir tree, which I'm sure had some name like Big Lumber on it, uh, it, it, it was well known or suspected at least that this was the single tallest tree on planet Earth. Okay, in Washington State, uh, and take a wild guess what they did with it. Uh, full knowledge that it was the tallest tree on planet Earth. They went out there with a chainsaw and cut it down. Just humans being humans. What is that, uh... That song by Terry Allen, White Boys. White Boys, uh, we're white boys. We see it standing, gotta knock it down. Yuppers, but we're gonna talk about some non-white boys in a minute. So that was the, the tale of that tree. If you're ever wondering what happened to the tallest tree on the planet, it went the way of this little piker uh, invasive species sycamore tree over in England. Okay. Back to whatever this fellow's name was. <clears throat> I went to Hadrian's Wall yesterday partly to report a story about how the felling of the tree at Sycamore Gap creates an opening literal and figurative through which we can look with fresh eyes at the upland landscapes of Britain and partly to pay my respects to the fallen giant whose honey-sweet scent and rustling leaves still fill that famous cleft in the landscape. While there, I met Mike Pratt, director of local conservation organization, Northumberland Wildlife Trust. Like so many others, Pratt sees the crime as dire evidence that too many in today's society have lost all reverence for and understanding of the rest of the living world. I love this quote from Mike Pratt, quote, If a tree is sacred enough, it will never be chopped down. Well, apparently that tree was not sacred enough. The tallest tree uh, on planet Earth was not sacred enough. Uh, obviously, the hemlock trees that uh, went into making my tiny houses were not sacred enough. I also spoke to my friend Pete Leeson, who works for the Woodland Trust. While sharing Pratt's concern, Leeson honed in on the positive light, huh? The positive light revealed by the mass outpouring of feeling. Quote, It's amazing and brilliant that so many people have responded with their emotional stories and their recollections of that fantastic tree. Close quote. Leeson 
<clears throat> Leeson draws a direct link, a direct link between that potent emotional response and the deeply rooted, the deeply rooted connection indigenous people in the Amazon and beyond feel when their forest are assaulted? Mm. If he is right about this, and we're going to give Leeson a lesson here, Leeson's lesson here in a minute, civilians of the industrialized world have not entirely forgotten or rejected all our connections to the living matrix that supports all our lives. Not yet. Well, guys, obviously I cannot let this one pass about the noble savages. I don't know if I have ever on this channel told the day about when my final uh, little limp dick lefty snowflake, snowflake uh, myth of the noble savage died when I finally disabused myself of uh, the myth of the noble savage. As some of you know, I spent several months in the Peruvian Amazon in the year 2009. I wrote a book about it called Peruvian Plunge, and if you go over to that other channel, it might even be on this channel now, uh, if either on this channel or I know over there on Humpty Dumpty Tribe, I actually re read the entire book about my summer down there. So, one of the people I was hanging out with, so what I was down there uh, investigating was not deforestation, but was this uh, oil company from Texas, Hunt Oil Company, was down there searching for oil and gas uh, inside uh, basically an Amazon Indian reservation down there on the banks of the Mother of God River. And uh, so one of the one of the main characters in the book uh, was this uh, local uh, Stone Age Indian. Well, he's one generation uh, removed from Stone Age, uh, living in this little Amazon Indian village called Shintuya, Peru. His name was Ramon. And Ramon, among other things, he was an ayahuasca shaman. The guy was an absolute, he was the poster child of every noble savage fantasy on the, he was the poster child uh, uh, of the noble savage fantasy. He had a, uh, a, a tattoo of a jaguar paw on it, and he, and he, and he wore, you know, just imagine, the guy was an absolute stud muffin, uh, can imagine, uh, I mean, you should have seen all the white girls throwing themselves at him, all those little uh, hippie chicks, good lord, Ramon did all right for himself, and anyway, Ramon uh, was one of the most vocal opponents to Hunt Oil Company. Uh, he was the leading charge in the village to kick big oil and gas out of the Amara Kari uh, Indian Reserve down there. Uh, the Amara Kari Reserve. So anyway, I had known Ramon uh, for several months, I never knew what Ramon did for a job. Never knew what, uh, what, what, he, what he did for a job. It never really occurred to me. Uh, he lived pretty good. Uh, he had the only flush toilet in the village of Shintoya. I remember he was very proud of his formica table. 
in his uh, little house. And so Centuria, Peru, it was on the banks of the Mother of God River. The Madre de Dios ran through it and, and ran through Amaracari. All of the forest had already been cut down around the village. The village was just an absolute wasteland. Looked a lot like where this uh, sycamore tree over there in England and so all the big trees were already gone, had been there, gone for years inside the reserve and cut down by the local Indians is what I heard. But apparently it was the Catholic mission was, uh, you know, inside the, the village who was hiring all the local natives to cut down the forest. And so it was gone, but I was down there uh, looking into the fossil fuel development. Now, I did have a chapter talking about all of the local natives working on those illegal gold mines up and down the Mother of God River, how the, the, the main people actually operating those planet-killing gold mines were the natives living in the thing. Uh, so anyway, never really thought about it. So one day uh, I was looking for Ramon and I found his sister and I was asking her where Ramon was that I wanted to talk to him and she told me he was at work. And I said, oh, I said, I've always wanted to know what Ramon does for a living. And she was saying this word. I don't know if it was Spanish or Amazon Indian. And I didn't recognize the word. And what she did was she was pointing on the other side of the Mother of God River. And where you could hear, as you always could, the sound of these goddamn chainsaws. Uh, I call it Gideon's trumpet, the sound of chainsaws in the Amazon rainforest. And you could hear these chainsaws and she's pointing that he's over there working on the other side of the river. And, and I still didn't understand what she was talking about. And finally, she goes like this. She goes, <coughs> like this. And I said, motocerro? See, motocerro, which is chainsaw. Uh, Ramon was a logger. And that was the day this Amazon ayahuasca shaman uh, fighting big oil and all of this made his living as a logger in uh, the Mother of God uh, river shed. And that was the day that I disabused myself of this unadulterated horse shed a uh, noble savage fantasy, you know, when, when, I, when I found Ramon and sort of confronted him uh, with it, he shrugged and, and goes, Samuel, he goes, I like my flesh toilet, I like my Formica table, and I like my comfortable chair. Anyway, uh, where was I? This crap, the deeply rooted connection indigenous people in the Amazon feel when their forests are assaulted. Please. As William Blake observed in 1799 when he wrote, quote, The tree which moves some to tears of joy is, in the eyes of others, only a green thing which stands in the way. Mm. 
Our relationship with nature has always been complicated. What then are we to do? How can we channel the primal feelings that surfaced this week for the collective good? And then they go into this hopium. Uh, I, I, uh, here's one immediate suggestion for those in the UK anyway. Whether you live in a city center, a town, or in the countryside, you are blessed to share your world with a huge number of veteran trees, many of them ancient, overlooked, and genuinely irreplaceable. I'm not making this up. This is a direct quote. This had to have been some uh, dark irony from a copy editor. Go out and hunt for one in your neighborhood, get to know it, and then log it. Go out and hunt for one in your neighborhood, get to know it, and then log it. Oh, I'm sorry. Get to know it and then log it on the Woodland Trust Ancient Tree Inventory. Yes. Uh, but just as there is no immediate way to replace a 300-year-old invasive species tree, we must also acknowledge there are no quick fixes for humankind's increasingly strained and distorted relationship with the wider living world. That said, the headline from the UK's recent State of Nature report that has received the least attention might just be the most important one of all. Conservation and rewilding action works, as you can see outside of uh, this window here. When we give nature a chance, it will come roaring back. And then uh, if you enjoy that story, you might also enjoy reading Why Aren't There More Trees in the Sycamore Gap? Wow! Why aren't there more trees in the Sycamore Gap? But, uh, uh, we're wrestling with that real brain teaser why there aren't more trees in a national park in England. We're going to let Andy the gardener uh, elucidate what really went down in Zombie Island last week. <clears throat> it's a big story over here in Zombie Island, it's getting more press than the axing of uh, this uh, high-speed railroad, which is a whole nother rant that Andy uh, is so talking about. The giant tree is getting more press than the axing of this high-speed railroad, and certainly the Amazon rainforest ever has. The gist of it is that somebody chained down in the middle of the night one of our most famous trees, apparently. An old sycamore tree that was growing by Hadrian's Wall, the wall the Romans built to keep the Scottish out. It's a mystery like Nessie and Picnic at Hanging Rock, as there was no reason for it. I love it. It pisses people off not knowing why. I could tell them why, but I'm not going to. It was like an icon. One brave tree standing firm in a desolate, treeless, arctic tundra landscape against all odds. A few problems with this. First, the landscape there is not Arctic tundra. It is only treeless because of humans. 
Hmm. It is only treeless because of humans and their millions of sheep and deer. A few hundred wolves would sort out that in no time. Naturally, there would be oak forest growing there. Secondly, sycamore is an invasive tree, according to Andy, from North America. Uh, according to Google, it's native to continental Europe. According to Andy, he's thinking the tree was brought over from North America, so who knows. So, I can't really see what the fuss is about. The person who chopped it down did the right thing. The Guardian is saying it's just an illustration of our disconnect from nature and just a reaction to its environmentalism and common sense proposal of covering the landscape with wind turbines and nuclear power stations. Thus, to the ordinary Daily Mail reading white supremacist, trees are fucking Nazis. Like, just stop oil protesters and cyclists. Makes sense to cut one down as a form of political protest, etc. Sadly, the police investigating the tree's murder did not spot the small oak sapling planted close by. Ha ha. There you go. Uh, that is Andy the Gardener's version. The guys who cut it down did the right thing. Getting rid uh, uh, of some invasive species to let the oak sapling go. Thank you, Andy, for uh, putting it in proper perspective. But anyway, I have got to get ready for uh, my wave of uh, vacation tourists coming to enjoy what's left of the leaves in this second growth forest here in New York, baby. So, uh... I'm 99.9% sure that uh, this whole forest all around here uh, probably looked like Hadrian's Wall a hundred years ago. If you just get rid of the humans and their damn sheep and stuff, uh, this is what Hadrian's Wall would look like. And then, of course, the humans would come and start chopping down those trees to build their tiny houses to have their uh, vacation rental businesses, which I need to go deal with. Get out there and uh, enjoy a giant sycamore before it falls on your head. Bye, guys.